We are living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Welcome everyone. Thank you very much for coming to this Change Makers presentation. This is a series of six presentations that will be done over the year by various members of the Professoriate of Lincoln University. I'd like to also mention that we've got some of our Global Challenge scholars here. So there's some, some of the lads and lasses with black shirts on. We'll have some microphones at the end for the question session. And they'll also be helping with one or two things during the evening. So thank you for coming. It's my very great pleasure tonight to MC this lecture, and my name is Bruce McKenzie. I'm Dean of the Faculty of Agriculture and Life Sciences at Lincoln University. Tonight we're going to be hearing from Professor David Palmer, who's a professor in the Department of Wine, Food, and Molecular Biosciences. And he's going to talk to us about his work on animal models used to develop human medical treatments, gene therapies for a fatal neurodegenerative disease in sheep that is also a very serious disease of young children. David started at Lincoln University in 1993, and he's a professor in the department that I mentioned. David has taught a wide range of undergraduate and postgraduate courses, mostly in biochemistry, and he's done a significant amount of postgraduate supervision, both PhDs and master level, in his area of speciality. He's been working on Batten's disease since his time at Massey, where he did finish and um, received his PhD from Massey. And it's fascinating the work that David's done. I think you're going to get a good feel for him. This, this work is showing great promise for helping to control this particularly unpleasant disease that, that David will go into. We certainly hope that you'll enjoy the evening. David's got a fascinating talk for you, and I'll leave you in his hands now. Thank you, David. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Um, is this, everyone hearing me okay? Yep. Um, so what I do want to talk about really is an area that's of great interest to me. Um, I still got into biochemistry in University College in London and we studied healthy rats and biochemistry as far as medicinal or bio medical biochemistry is concerned dealt with healthy rodents and not very well people. And I wondered whether there was any opportunities of doing this the other way around. And I think, I hope by the end of the evening, uh, you're well and truly convinced that there are. Um, so that's the starting point. And I want to talk about that in the context of uh, a serious group of diseases, in fact, called Batten disease. Now, Batten disease was first described in Norway in the, er well, fairly early 19th century um, in a village in Norway where there were some children that obviously didn't do well. This is a, a translation of the first paper on it that, that appeared in a Norwegian journal then. And it's fair to say that really not a lot's changed in many ways. There's still um, a feeling in some quarters that we should be aware of spells and trolls and fairies and nociferous things that uh, influence people. But really this situation's now changing dramatically. I we, well, um, by the end you'll see what I mean. And so it's been a good time, and it is a good time, to be working in this area. Um, so here again, now Batten disease, as I said, it's a group of diseases. 
uh, it affects about one in 12 and a half thousand live births worldwide. So in New Zealand, that translates to about four children born a year. Uh, we generally find two of them. We're not sure on the numbers. Um, it's said to be now the most common reason for child dementia. The children start life normally, then they go through in various stages the set of symptoms that's outlined here from blindness, brain atrophy, motor deterioration, and then premature death. Um, as I said, there's not much treatment. Here's a biopic of a, of a little boy um, who died of Batten disease to give you an idea. So if you look in the um, top left corner, uh, you'll see a gorgeous looking five-year-old. Actually, this kid is already profoundly blind. He's having severe behavioral difficulties. He's meaning that he's racked with nightmares and hallucinations and he stumbles around and you can see his rapid decline between six and seven <coughs> in this form of Batten disease and at the end he's only reliant for sustenance on his food tube to his stomach and he died. Uh, as I said it's a group of diseases. I've put out the Gene locations for the, um, on a human chromosome set here to give you some idea. So these are each actually a separate disease. They've got lots of different um, names after clinicians that first described them and different countries fight over them. Um, they've got now the CLN notation and I'll come to that in a minute. Um, there's actually 14 now described in the literature. Some of them aren't so certain to be what we call classic forms of Batten disease, but they are bound together despite the genes being in different places. And so each form has a whole family of mutations under it. They are bound together by this common symptomality and um, other things that I'll come to in a tick, hallmarks I'll come to in a tick. Um, so back to what I said at the beginning, when I came back to New Zealand in 1980 and went to Massey, um, I got a job with a vet, uh, Bob Jolly, um, and he was interested in lysosomal storage diseases in livestock, uh, particularly in Aberdeen Angus cattle, there was a disease, manosidosis. We've got a, a parent of some twins, aren't they, with, with a form of manosidosis here, so he's very well aware of Bob's work. And Bob had done a lot in delineating the condition in, in these, in cattle in these diseases, um, which are also human diseases. But my task was that South Hampshire sheep that's looking at you there with the CLN6 form of Batten disease. Um, since then, and since I've been at Lincoln, we've found Another form of Batten disease, the CLM5 form in Borderdales um, here. So this was kind of what I'd always wanted at University College. Here's an animal disease which is representative of a human disease and we can really study the disease in the animals from the beginning to the end and there's lots of other advantages in that. Um, as you can imagine, you, they do things like called... Um, what do they call them? Elective post-mortems. So the, the cause of death they write on a form is something nociferous. The actual cause of death is met a vet in the post-mortem room. That's, that's uh, So you can study the disease once you've built up a population at any stage and you can start to work on the early stages of the disease and the development of the disease right through, which is very much largely inaccessible in the human condition. Um, sheep, as I said, are ideal. And um, if we look at this picture here, so these are sort of to scale. Up here's a mouse brain, which is, the, there's lots of mouse forms of Batten disease that have been built and so on. This is a human brain, uh, it weighs about 1 1.3, 1 1.4 kilograms as an adult. 
And here's a sheep brain, which is a little over 100 grams as an adult. You can see here the um, sluicy and gyri that have this complicated brain pattern here that's replicated in the sheep. And the regions in the brain that perform functions um, are associated with each other. That, that's absent in the sheep brain. Um, sheep are really easy care animals. I mean, there's been forms of these diseases diagnosed in dogs and so on. These are relatively difficult. Um, the, the forms of the disease in cattle are a bit hard to handle, really. They're a bit big. The sheep are about the same size as we are. Um, they're organised similarly. They have a similar pathology and they're also social animals. And we've been breeding them for about 11,000 years so that we can live together, really. Um, so that is a big help. If, if you do this another way, if you want to do experiments on chimpanzees in the United States, you've got a housing cost of about $100,000 a year per animal. And we don't have anything like that sort of cost to graze sheep at Lincoln. Um, so I mentioned um, other hallmarks of batten disease. Now these, one of the things that's really common is these storage bodies in cells here in, um, in a neuron, a big giant neuron. They stain here with uh, a blue stain, looks all fast blue. Here you can see them under a fluorescent microscope and they have this golden glow. Here. Now these don't just occur in the brain, they occur in most cell types throughout the body. Um, and I want to say now that not in sheep nor in humans is there any systematic description of any non-central nervous system disease. Um, everything that we know about the, the disease is attributable to the central nervous system. So you've got big degrees of storage in the liver, in the kidney, in the pancreas, and we'll come to that in a tick, but um, you don't have diseases in those tissues. Um, now that led to a lot of confusion. And one of the common names, and I've mentioned already this NCL, CLN names for these genes. So the fluorescence, this was attributed to um, massive polymers that arise from the abnormal peroxidation of lipids and they coupled to form insoluble aggregates and these look like the um, so-called lipopigment, steroid, and lipofuscin, the aging pigment. This has led to a huge industry now of antioxidants and diets and all sorts of things. But it did cause these diseases to get called the neuronal steroid lipofuscinosis, which um, is abbreviated to the NCLs. The, I personally prefer, and a lot of us now prefer to use a collective term, Batten disease. Batten was a disease. Uh, physician who described early disease in, in humans and people can spell it and we know what it is and this name's really rather misleading because that's just not true that whole story and that's really what I did first um, with the sheep oh, before I do that uh, the clinical conditions in these sheep and the both breeds of sheep are very similar in their clinical conditions. So we've got the same set of clinical conditions. The other really striking feature of pretty much all forms of Batten disease is you get this brain atrophy. Brains actually shrink and they shrink rather a lot. In our CLN5 sheep um, at 25 months, those were the Borderdales, we get down to 60% and in the CLN6 near a 50% um, of the normal brain weights. And that was described as massive and universal and stuff. And that's not true either and we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, before I do that though, I would need to 
go over some stuff. Now, there's a, a thing here. There's a lot of information in here that I've pruned out, and you'll find it on posters. So where you say on these slides, see a poster, that there'll be a poster out in the foyer, and there'll be one of my wonderful colleagues able to um, explain it to you if I'm not around. And that's the case with these gene products. We do have gene tests for these uh, sheep, and we know what the mutations are. Basically, though, the, the proteins underlying bat disease. Now, um, so the proteins are the products of the genes, and if the gene's wrong, the protein's wrong, and it doesn't function. Uh, so there's two classes. There's one class that are soluble proteins, and these have a mannose-6-phosphate receptor on them that helps them being transported around the cells, and we'll come back to that. And then there's the insoluble proteins that are inserted into membranes. And they have consequences, those two classes, and how you think you can go about treatment. And actually, it looks like the hypothetical consequences aren't are much more serious than the actual ones, which is a rather good, good thing to find. Going back to a storage body. Now, this is a pancreas, actually, of one of our sheep. And this thing here is the storage body here. Uh, sitting there, it's got a limiting membrane. This is a lysosome-derived organelle, and it's full of stuff here. So these get packed with this material. Um, as I said, that was thought to be products of abnormal lipid peroxidation, and it's not. Uh, and the sort of basic argument was, and still is a bit amongst pathologists, that this stops cell function and chokes the cells, and I've even heard people talking about cellular feces, which I think I described at a conference as a shitty hypothesis. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, that, that was the dogma. Um, this is more, kind of more intriguing, and this sort of set me on a different way. So. Um, we wanted to isolate these things and actually see what they were made of. That was quest one. Here you've got one of those storage bodies in an electron micrograph freeze fracture. So this is magnified about a quarter of a million times here. Here's a rock in the Wiper River bed, Wiper Gorge. And uh, you, I mean, I remember kidding my boys, I think Max half believed when we said they were dinosaur eggs, fossilised dinosaur eggs, but that's not true either. But um, when you look at this and you think about it, you think, well, how hard are these things? So it's trying to isolate these using delicate techniques and for isolating lysosomes. And I was talking to some virology colleagues at, at Lincoln, uh, Massey rather, and well, no, we better do this first. Uh, I'll come back to that in a tick. So when I say these are lysosomal storage diseases, so lysosomes are organelles that primary functions to degrade macromolecules back down to building blocks that are sent back into the metabolic cycle of the cell and remade. So proteins go to amino acids, DNA and RNA go to, to um, single nucleotides. Um, and there's about 60 specific enzymes in the lysosome that do that. When we get a missing enzyme, the breakdown's blocked, so partly degraded material accumulates and it stays in the lysosome usually. And that's why it's called a lysosomal storage disease. They've got a lot of things in common. They're inherited, they're usually fatal, and they usually have severe neurological symptoms. Um, Back to my story of my rock. So my virologist said, well, Dave, you know, you could try what we'd do if they were viral particles. We'd sonicate everything for ages and they'll probably fall out. And they did. And this is what I got, an electron micrograph. Uh, so these are particles. These are actually from a sheep pancreas now. Um, and we've lost our membrane and all that. But these are the contents of those worlds there. So then I'm trying to work out what they're made of. And I'm not going to say a lot about what was quite a long and, whoops, interesting journey. Um, 
But I found out that over half of the mass of those bodies was one particular protein, the C subunit of mitochondrial ATP synthase. The rest of the mass of, of those things were lipids and other components associated with a normal lysosome. So what we've got is a specific storage of a protein in a mitochondrial protein um, in lysosomes. Um, and what makes that even more intriguing, um, at this stage, I got in touch with uh, Sir John Walker in Cambridge, who's become a good friend, and he's, been, he's given a talk at Lincoln, amongst other things. Um, and he was working on the full ADP synthase molecule, um, and in 97, I think he got the Nobel Prize for determining its structure. But here's a band of the proteins in the entire enzyme, and here's our storage body protein, and you can see we've got just the C subunit here. Um, so the ADP synthase is actually a very important molecule. The downside is we're looking for an enzyme that would be the next enzyme needed to break down a macromolecule. So we're looking for an incompletely degraded molecule. We didn't find that. We found the subunit C stored is complete and normal. So that theory didn't work. This is specifically stored in most forms of Batten disease, despite the big differences in the genes and gene products. Uh, it's actually a very difficult protein to work with. It aggregates, it's insoluble in prote protein solvents, and it has lipid-like properties, which is probably why histologically you've got these lipid accumulation bodies and the name lipopigment. Although I have seen written also described colourless lipopigments, so I've wondered about that too. Um, one of the other things I mentioned, oh, just before that, so there's a poster out there and Bing at the front here is, um, she worked with John and did a master's at, uh, between us and she'll run through how it all works. That's an interesting story in itself. Um, so I mentioned the brain shrinkage. So here's a normal sheep brain, 99 grams. This um, is a picture I stole yesterday from Nadia, who's down the front here, um, and she, her name will come up again. Um, here's one of those CLN6 affected brains, and here's a CLN6 affected CLM5, CLN6. And you can see here that although that atrophy was described as global, in fact, the cerebellum, this end of the brain, is basically normal, that there's a lot of atrophy around here and there's actually quite a lot around here. And what we found out is this under part of the brain here is pretty much normal. Uh, so there's regionality in this brain atrophy. It's not this universal um, shrinkage. And you can see that here in some sections. This is some technology we developed. I think we could owe Manfred Oswald for this, but we've got a marvellous resource in that we can take the brains and we can cut serial section right through a brain and we can pick out all the layers and we have big microscope slides and if you think that a, a sheep brain's about the size of a woman's fist with a big slide you can get a whole slice on it um, so you can see here in the control brain we've got quite a healthy um, visual cortex here and the affected brain it declines very rapidly here it's really nearly all gone the motor cortex here in the affected brain shrinking, but much more slowly. Um, and as I said, the subcortical regions of the brain are pretty much the same as they all were. Also um, looking at that, and this is some work Katarina's been mainly doing on CT scanning, 
you can see that there's ventricles in the brain. These become quite important later and it uh, increasing in size with the degree disease. So we wanted to know then, well, we, we thought we knew anyway, but we thought we'd better make sure, whether the storage body accumulation actually correlated in any way with the atrophy of the brain and the development of the disease. Already we knew that the symptoms go with the regions of the brain that atrophy. So the occipital cortex and the visual cortex, they go with vision decline. Um, the motor functions of the humans and the sheep pretty much survive until quite late disease. So the slower motor cortical design goes with that. So what we've done here is we take over the, the brain, um, the visual cortex, we look at the, the, for the fluorescence and quantify that, and that's an indication of the number of storage bodies. And you find here with age, that goes up relentlessly, evenly pretty much in all areas of the brain. If we look though at the thickness of the cortical layer, that, that decreases much more rapidly in the visual cortex in the affected sheep, substantially, but less so in the parietal occipital cortex, and in the motor cortex, it really more just stops growing. So you can see here, there's a regionality of the degeneration that doesn't go with the storage body distribution. So if we look here at this, so we've got these mutations, they're causing the subunit C accumulation, mutations in a number of genes actually. Um, they cause the subunit C accumulation and we get a neurodegeneration. But this arrow here, you can pretty much put a cross on. Um, so it's not really the accumulation of storage bodies that's causing the neurodegeneration. And this has consequences for human medicine. There were various regimes of finding drugs that will clear the storage bodies out of cells and stuff like that. A lot of them were rather unpleasant for children. Um, one of the other things, though, that occurred um, has been, and I suppose this is in, in a lot of diseases, actually, is sort of autoimmune activation diseases. Now, Glial cells are the other sorts of cells in the brain. You've got the neurons, uh, which carry the nerve messages, but they've got a lot of support from astrocytes and microglia, and their function is to groom and look after the neurons in the brain. They remove spent materials, provide nutrients, um, and they also help with the networking. And they become activated in result uh, response to injuries and insults to the brain. But sometimes they activate inappropriately and there's lots of theories that can become quite neurotoxic and very damaging. And what we did find when we looked at this, um, here looking at um, activation of perivascular macrophages in the brain, whereas our storage bodies rather slow in accumulation and our brain degeneration is quite a lot later in the disease. Um, even shortly after birth, you see, well, this is a bit... Um, in a normal brain, you see these quiet cells sitting on these uh, blood vessels here in the brain. Here in the, P12 means 12 days after birth here. And here you can see already these are rounded up and activated. And I kind of imagine them like buzz buzzing insects that are angry. They sort of look like that to me. So this is a very early part of the disease process. Um, and essentially, I'm going to leave that there. We've been carrying on with that. Um, the other thing I mentioned at the beginning, well, earlier anyway, was the difference between the soluble and the membrane 
gene products that cause Batten disease. Um, and there were two classes. I should have said, all these phenomena are very similar in both our sheep models. Now one of them, the CLN5 sheep, this is a defect in a soluble lysosomal protein. Uh, it's probably an enzyme, but we don't know what the substrate is. No one does. Now these collect a thing during synthesis from the endoplasmic reticulum called a mannose-6-phosphate marker. That mannose-6-phosphate marker then binds to a mannose-6-phosphate receptor. These get collected into one area of the, the... What would I call it? What is called the... It's a network of vesicles that, that um, organise transport and stuff within the cell. Um, so the bud areas bud off here. Um, the sol membrane bound proteins, they also get inserted into the membrane. They also have similar signals for collecting as do the um, mannose-6-phosphate receptor. They get into these vesicles that are kind of now addressed to go to lysosomes. So they continue on a journey to lysosomes, the receptors get recycled back to the Trans-Golgi network. And this is reasonably fast. This takes less than a minute to, to make all this journey in cells. Um, but it's not very accurate. The, there's a good 10% of the mannose-6-phosphate addressed proteins that go out with the proteins that are meant to be secreted from the cells. And we have in our plasma membranes more mannose 6-phosphate receptors. So what this means is that cells can pick up enzyme secreted by other cells and import it because these then go back to the journey to lysosomes. And this has opened up a whole field of um, enzyme replacement therapy whereby you inject a, an enzyme into a cell, it'll get picked up uh, by the mannose 6-phosphate receptors in the plasma membrane and internalised to the lysosome where it's meant to be. Um, it also means with gene therapy that I'm coming to soon that you don't have to correct all the cells. If you correct some of the cells, you've got a mechanism to correct the other cells that isn't available for the membrane-bound proteins, or apparently not available. So a kind of a dogma is that you can have intracellular correction for soluble um, lysosomal proteins, but not really likely for membrane-bound proteins. And we wanted to set out if that was true, and this was working with Graham Kay and Nigel J, and they had developed the technology to make chimeras. So we th thought we'd make some chimeric lambs. Now by this I mean we've taken cells from a, an, a normal sheep embryo at 16 to 32 cell stage with cells from an affected embryo, and you mix them together into the two old embryos, and you put them back in the ewe, and they implant, and the lambs grow up. And you know little Chester here is chimeric, because he's got these footy socks on, and he should just have black feet, and his patterned face is rather odd too. And this is a classical thing in animals, of, of, of um, looking at chimeric mice, for instance, by their coat patterns. Um, now, of course, in your head, you always get perfectly 50-50 chimeras. You don't. You get all sorts of proportions, um, depending on which cells end up residing in which area. Um, and, I'll, and they can vary through the, the animal. I've just picked out one example here. I just want to go through this briefly. I mentioned we had gene tests. So... Our AA banding here, these are affected. Our GAs are carriers and our GGs are normal. And that's really all you need to know here. So here are tissues from a 
chimeric sheep. So here, the liver is pretty much all affected. The pancreas is pretty much all affected. The thyroid's a mixture. The kidneys, pretty much normal. Skeletal muscles, largely affected. Cardiac muscles, both. Thymus is both. Most regions of the brain are both. So we've got varying degrees of chimerism in various tissues throughout the animal. So does that make a difference to the development? And the, the answer is yes. Um, we split these animals at some point into groups called affected, affected like, um, recovering like, and normal like. And we let them go. And we found some remarkable things. This, this one here, which was recovering like, started off with a, a squizzle of a brain. These are brain volumes, by the way, as estimated by CT scanning. And I'll come back to that. Um, so these brains grew, these brains grew, these ones that we've called affected like didn't grow at all, really. Um, we, we finally <laughs> ran out of patience, really, and decided it was time to actually look inside the sheep. If you go back to that graph of I had of the cortical thinning, um, here, in our, here we've got a normal sheep cortex measurements. Here we've got affected like cortex measurements and here affected. And these are very similar here. But our recovering like and our normal like are pretty similar to the normals. So that's good. And the only thing that was wrong with that is if I was feeling a little suspicious with a referee's hat on, I'd say, oh, well, that's easy. You're just telling me stories about the degree of chimerism. And they're basically all pretty normal. But when you look at another stain here, um, you can see in the affected grey matter, you get these rather odd-looking cells here in the affected like. These are odd-looking cells. Here in the recovering and the normal like, you get much more healthy-looking. These are actually neuroblastic cells, a stain for neuroblastic cells. Um, here in the normal and the normal like, but you don't get them in the normal. So the normal is different from the normal like and the recovering, the same in the white matter. The normal is different from the normal like and the recovering. Um, so I hope you're convinced that these were genuinely chimeric cells and having some healthy cell population in those chimeras rescued the affected cells. So really the point then I want to make with that is it means that gene therapy or enzyme replacement therapy can be possible in diseases where you're dealing with membrane-bound proteins, which if you remember was about half the different forms of batten disease. Uh, we tried therapy of suppressing this early glial activation um, and we picked out one anti-inflammatory drug because it was freely available and affordable um, and we needed lots of it. Treated a sheep for about 18 months, I think. We had them eating it. Um, they, uh, they tolerated it very well once, once we got them used to it. Um, they got pharmacological concentrations in the brain, so it, reaching the target tissue wasn't a problem, but it didn't affect the disease. Um, and since then, mainly Gerald's been pushing on defining the neuroinflammatory pathway because we're really interested in finding the target, if, if there's a target that's druggable. And Gerald will be outside with a poster where she can tell you about that afterwards. Um, so the other big hit then is viral vectors for gene therapy. So here, uh, viruses are particles of DNA or RNA, and they carry genetic information into cells to make themselves, and a lot of copies of themselves. And they kidnap the cells 
machinery for making things. So instead of the cell making things it should be making for the cell, it's making virus for the virus and packing proteins. And then the cells burst open and they go off and rip into another one. Um, so what you can do is you can strip out of virus particles the genetic material it uses to make itself. And instead of that, put in the genetic material for the gene you want the cell to make. And what you've then got left in the virus is a little bit that will introduce that package into a cell, but it will then use that genetic information to make the protein you want, and it won't be able to make loads of virus. So you're really limited to the number of times you can get the virus to enter cells. Um, you have to be a bit careful to target the tissues you want to, and you've got to be careful you don't create some other diseases. Um, but that's it. Um, so working with uh, Stephanie Hughes at Otago made us um, some viral vectors. So here we've got two different sorts. We've got long-term repeats um, and lenny-viral vectors. And these bits here at the ends, these are the bits that carry the package, if you like, what I'm calling the vector, into the cell. These, here's our genes that we want, our ovine CLM5 and CLM6 genes, and these are promoters so that that gene gets read and protein made from it. And we've been injecting into the brain, into the parenchyma, common matter, but I said keep an eye on those ventricles because we've pretty much established that you don't have to do all that. If you inject directly into here, into those ventricle spaces, that will move the virus right around the central nervous system with the CSF and you will um, infect, if you like, cells through the entire central nervous system. So this is a big thing for us because the challenge of trying to get there through uh, injection, you know, vascular injection or anywhere like that is, is huge. You've got a blood-brain barrier on the road and you need enormous amounts. Um, anyway, here we are. There's um, Nadia, um, who organises all these things. This is Rob McFarlane, Graham Kay at the time. We've got a, another team now and here's me supervising. Um, Here's our sheep in, a, in a, a frame. We've got to hold it. Um, here's the needle going into the brain and down into the ventricles. And here's a, a sheep that's had its injection about an hour afterwards uh, on its feet and uh, looking for something to eat. So they, they tolerate it pretty well. I don't, we, we've not lost any as a consequence. And the results from this for the CLN5 sheep have been absolutely remarkable. So this is with a single injection. Um, I must admit this is preclinical. These are genetically diagnosed sheep. Um, but here in the green dots, you have these neurological function scores that really Nadia's, just all Nadia's data. Um, these are what happens with the affected sheep until you can't do anything. Um, here's our Lendi viral infected CLN5 sheep. Eventually they go blind, uh, well the eyesight declines, which accounts for this here because there's an eyesight component in this. Um, but otherwise they're fine. So these sheep uh, fine in all respects, apart from some visual defects, really after they're completely overwhelmed by the disease, if they didn't have the injection. We've kept one, she's still fine. What's that now, 30 months later? Um, so we don't know how long that goes on. Um, with the CLN6 genes, that wasn't so successful in that Five out of six of our injected sheep, they declined with, with time. Maybe it was a little gain, but not a lot. But one of them, this 
red one here, that just went on. And you can, this was the pie, and eventually, um, not long ago, <coughs> uh, she was fine, but we really needed to know, because we were getting on to the next generation of CLN6 vectors, and we needed to know what we'd done or not. So we sacrificed her, and this is a slide that was prepared, well, again, I nicked this panel from Nadia early afternoon. Uh, so here's a control brain, here's the CLN, most of those CLN6 treated brains, and this is all compressed up in the cortical thinning, and here's the visual cortex of that, we, we call it a pie, this red one here, that just went on and on. So for this one, it really worked. Um, and I think pretty sure yesterday we also found that there was considerable gene expression in that, CLN6 gene expression in that sheep from the Vecna. Uh, another thing that he's been doing, this is important. Now these techniques are really quite important and I'll come to why in a minute. Um, that has been doing longitudinal maze testing and we want to continue on that. Again, the, um, the control sheep, they can keep going through the maze, no problems. The normal untreated affected sheep, they, they give up. This is the time it takes to go through a reasonably simple maze, but they just, they just becomes hopeless at this point. Um, the injected CLN5 sheep, they kept going through the maze pretty well, marginally better than the control, but I think wasn't one of the controls kind of a bit dreamy and used to just wander off, wasn't really that interested in the maze. Um, the principle of the maze was you put a, break, a group of sheep at, in a pen at the end and then one sheep's got to go and find it. And they don't need to be stressed much in any way. They just need to be less than absolutely comfortable and they'll go and find their friends. They really are sociable in that sense. So you don't have to provoke them much and they'll mob up and stick together. Um, here, this is our pie going through the maze fine, these are the other CLN6 sheep that were maybe better, maybe not, hard to tell, but it was becoming hopeless at this stage. Um, I mentioned CT scanning of brain volumes, so here are those CT scans of the CLN5 intracranial volumes here for the uh, only injected sheep. And as you can see, they're going up with the blue line, which is the control sheep. The green line is the uh, collected data from a whole lot of affected sheep. So here we've got normal brain growth. Here with the CLN6, again, the brains declined in volume while the pie she kept growing and going. Um, Katerina, who's here somewhere, um, she's been doing this um, pretty carefully, and so we've developed 3D models. Actually, I meant to bring over, we've got 3D printouts of these brains. So you can actually get one in your hand, but it's sitting in my office. Um, so here's a control At 18 months, here's a treated at 18 months, and here's an affected at 18 months. And you can see that massive atrophy here and a lot of loss here, um, and that goes down through the slides here, whereas the treated ones are basically indistinguishable from the, from the normal controls. So we haven't got any loss of brain volume, and you can image that. Um, now, well, I'll come to that in a minute. So really, that's, that's my talk, and that's why I'm excited, but I wanted to mention another couple of things that I've sort of 
fiddled around with is where to from here. So we're interested in where the blindness comes from in those sheep that were otherwise treated and we're setting up to do um, ocular gene injections. We suspect that this is purely um, retinal degeneration and the blindness in, in the if untreated affected sheep's both got a central nervous component and a, a retinal component. Here we think it's just the retinal component. And the, that's the hardest part of the central nervous system to reach by these methods of injection. Um, as I said, we're still looking for neuroinflammatory cases, looking for druggable targets. Uh, this is kind of a sideline, but we still don't really know the link between the disease and the subunit C storage and all these diseases. Um, but here, really importantly, and we've gained some collaborators, I'm going to come into a minute, is this in vivo monitoring, MRI scanning. Um, and this is important because, as it turns out, when you start talking about two-year trials for treatments, if you then have to sacrifice the animal, you've lost three years, just like that. Whereas if you can go on monitoring them and gain data that's useful for human translation, which I'll come to on the next one, um, down here, then you can keep going on that. And um, so what we're doing here, we want to up our vectors. We've, we think we can really improve, we can get six out of six CLN6 sheep with better vectors. We want to rescue clinically affected animals. We're interested in long-term monitoring to survey the longer-term consequences of successful treatments. You know, it can be successful for, I don't know how long the treatment for Phenylketonuria was successful a long time, and it still is successful, but people are finding now that people that went through the remarkably successful dietary treatment in their middle age are developing some consequences of the disease. Um, so we don't know what this is. Um, we obviously advocate for this. We might need to explore combination therapies for later disease and rescue, which is why we're keen to keep going with the druggable targets and the immunotherapy. Um, but the prime thing, as I said, is this translation to human medicine. So the more in vivo data we can get that will persuade people to do uh, treatments in humans, the better. So if we can keep these sheep going a long time and keep collecting data, it becomes more and more powerful. The, um, Americans want a thing called a compelling case. That's their sort of gold standard. So you've got to convince a bunch of American doctors that this is going to work. Um, on that front, uh, last year I spent a lot of time on the telephone um, talking with a family of greys in California and we provided them with a a lot of our data and really encourage them. They're a very rich couple in, in, uh, well, in the film industry in, in California. And we got an email today from them that uh, one of their daughters, they had two daughters who were affected, that one of their daughters has undergone um, a treatment that's really based on our CLN6 gene therapy, that one that worked. Um, and uh, was his younger sister Gwen's um, enrolled for the trial as well. So this sort of is there in a sense. Now these people have got there because they've got huge amounts of money. The hoi polloi that have children with these diseases don't get these opportunities. You know, when you go begging, um, Hollywood stars don't just write you a check for a million bucks. That doesn't happen to most of us. Um, right, so now it's acknowledgements time. Um, so Barn, well, this is a collaboration that we've set up. Uh, and this is Animal, Animal Welfare. So there have been sort of three main Barn centres. 
There's us at Lincoln, there's Imke Traman, who I've been working with in Sydney since 1999, um, and her people. And they've got a different, another mob of sheep with batten disease. Um, and we worked for quite a long time with some vector stuff with Stephanie Hughes at Otago. Um, we've built up a number of collaborations. Some of them are here. Um, Nigel Anderson and uh, some Mars people, John Walker and Ian Fernley I mentioned, John Cooper in London who's been oh, a colleague of mine and worked with us since 1999. Uh, we've got um, a visitor from his lab helping us here at the moment, which we went on a holiday yesterday. Uh, Tracy Melzer in the Brain Research Institute, so we're moving in on MRI imaging, um, neuroimaging. Um, we're getting our vector now from a, one of the experts, Stephen Gray, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We've got a collaboration again. I've known Sarah a long time and Kevin Milnes in London. And we've got Brian Bigger, Bigger and Clara Leary from Manchester who are really wanting to up the gene injection protocols for lysosomal storage diseases and they were looking at the numbers for non-human primates and decided the easy way of doing this was come to work with us at Lincoln and do it in sheep. Um, so last but not least, in the middle of last year, we had a, um, a bar meeting and this was well received by all. So here's the, most of the people that are at it, there's two not there, Linda Duggan, and uh, Linda Dugan, rather, and Graham Burrell. But we had all sorts. We had people from Lincoln, people from the clinical school, New Zealand Brain Research Institute, University of Otago, Dunedin, a parent, Nadia, um, Amy Small, Lincoln people, Gerald, a parent, Lisa Archer, a parent who's in the front row here, student from Otago, parent, um, Shona Noble, a Sharon Noble, rather, a parent. Um, Ra Timms, a parent from Timaru. Cure Kids man, John Foreman, who's here, who's a parent with another disease, but I've worked, been with John a long time, working with other lysosomal diseases. Um, Stephanie Hughes from Otago. Marjorie Fraser, who's from the BDSRA in the United States and Funda, and preciously two patients and Tony and Noble from Auckland and Brad Timms from Timaru. And Brad's now really in coming to the end, but here he was with it enough to give us the thumbs up in the photo, which I didn't notice till after it was taken. So this was kind of a marvellous get together of, of everybody and um, that's it. Thank you. So a few get a cure for this because you've collaborated with so many different people and so many organisations. Who gets the patent for it? There won't be patents. No, I mean, people have tried to patent these things. Um, there's various bits and pieces. You run, it, I mean, you've opened a whole Pandora's box here. And there's a whole lot of problems around funding and patents and so on. Um, and actually, this is a real pain. We're under, as researchers, you know, we're reliant on money raised by non-charitable trusts and organisations like the NIH. If there is a patent, they're going to want their cut. Um, the, even this university will not accept funds from these organisations, even though they're raised for deliberate research in this area because there's no way of paying the overhead costs. Um, the government says that we should raise this money from private enterprise, from patentability, then the price of the development of the drugs becomes such that um, Pharmac won't buy them. So even if it works, there will not be drugs available in New Zealand. This is the case for a number of 
lysosomal storage diseases. So this whole area is actually a mess that is very much in need of sorting out. And as people go around making wild statements all over the place, and if I sound a little angry, it's because I am about this. I've been, been beaten up about it enough. But basically, for this to work in the real world, once you start going chasing patents and commercialization and so on, it gets out of the hands of Joe Public. And so the money that will go into biomedical research will be to find the magic in deer velvet that makes Koreans horny or whatever. You know, it, it's not going to go in this direction under that scenario. John? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 injected into the ventricles. Same as we did in the sheep, as I understand it. I mean, we're talking with them a lot, and then they wanted to... Well, I don't blame them in a way. I mean, I thought and I was advised that they'd need to go through a rigorous animal model, so we were going to do that with their sheep. We were going to be hoping to have enough results for them by May. They were too impatient and they managed to bully their way through doing it directly in their daughters. Um, Anthony. So the, so the blindness presumably is related to you know, things like Staggart's disease, so it's retinal accumulation of, of lipids. So that's presumably, um, you know, where it comes from. So no, a... no, it is, there's um, two, two factors, as I said. There's a collapse of the uh, visual and occipital cortex. So we don't know. We, we're working on some ERG studies to try and tease out the components of the blindness. There's retinal degeneration and advanced diseases of rods and cones have gone in effect. But it's not, <clears throat> that's not related to accumulation in the, in the rods and cones of lipids that aren't degraded properly? No, as far as I know, there's no accumulation of lipids. Um, the okay, that was, the, uh, the anyway, lipid the, story the, is a story, it's a the myth. The question was, that, so, the, so have um, CLN5 and CLN6 been um, cloned and expressed recombinantly in and, and characterized as the actual as the actual glycoproteins or is that um, was that not been done yet because I my understanding is like the function of the function of those two enzymes is sort of not known so is, is that when have they been cloned and expressed and characterized or not yet yes the CLN5 the CLN6 probably but there's not much characterization being done but yeah, the CLN6, um, actually Stephanie's done quite a lot of that with some clones we sent her. And I think some other people have too, yeah. John. Dave, I, I know you're very frustrated by the difficulty of getting funding for this research and I know that the same applies for other people who are studying very rare diseases and it seems that you know the government the science minister the health research council um, and probably the universities all seem to be most interested in things which has got the numbers of heart the number of patients with heart disease the number of patients with diabetes or those things where they think there's going to be a a big financial uh, a, a big health gain and a big financial windfall in it. But it's, it seems to us, and I know that over about you know, 15 or more years when I've been engaging with you in this, is that some of the best discoveries come from the rare and the obscure. And in fact, the, uh, the, the lipid lowering drugs that probably a third of the adult population is on now uh, comes from not from studying classic cardiovascular disease, but studying a very rare condition called familial hypercholesterolemia, where kids were having strokes and heart attacks at five, six, and seven. It, it just seems that there is a, um, 
things are a bit upside down in terms of the priorities that are given um, uh, to research funding in medicine. And in particular, when we've got these wonderful natural animal models of this disease and other related disease here in New Zealand, why is it so hard to get those authorities to understand this and to listen? That's, you, John, you've seen me try. I've even, I think I've even asked the head of Pharmac what his salary was <laughs> to his face. And he didn't even blush while he was telling a whole, telling Frida Evans, wasn't it? Yeah. Who was telling him she's going to die and the treatment's a lot less than his salary, but he still says they can't afford it. You know, what's the life worth? I mean, it's... Yeah, I'm a bit cynical about Pharmac. I'm a bit cynical about political pressures in this area. One of the things that you'll know, Lisa will know, is people talk about diseases not being serious because they're rare. If you've got the disease, it takes over your life. I mean, these are quantized human lives. And we've got those numbers. I think it costs about... Oh, Nadia, can you remember the annual care number? But anyway, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to look after and care for one of these children. That's the cost now. And most of that is borne by parents working 24-7 and, and a whole lot of special needs things and so on. So the other side of the cost thing is just letting it run as a disease isn't free by any means. It's just invisible. And there's a big difference between those two statements. Um, I personally don't like the way the people that make these decisions talk in that they want evidence that it works and evidence that it's perfect. And you explain to them that this is the beginning. I mean, that... Um, there's no intrinsic reason why these therapies need to be very expensive at all in the long run. These are, even though it looks a bit uh, spectacular, this business of putting a catheter into the, the ventricle in the head was performed on 24,000 Americans a year to reduce pressure from, from brain trauma that's causing edema. So you just drain out the pressure through the CSF by going straight under the ventricle, putting a drain in. Um, so the surgery's not hard. Um, the, so a lot of the costs are sort of well inflated. As I said, you know, you get drug companies involved and sure they go up. And I don't blame the drug companies. I mean, they're expected to give us huge amounts more money than it costs to do our research um, for, I'm not quite sure why, as, as overheads. Um, the, the analogy I like to use is if you had those sort of people look at the Wright brothers and Devers, they'd say there's no future in air transport. It never happen. You know, you look at it, hey, we can't afford to spend that much money to fly two guys 300 metres. I mean, this is insane. Three years of their lives building this damn thing and it flies three, 100 metres. Nah, forget it. And that's the real issue, that there's no place in these sort of risk assessment, financial triage people of being at the beginning of something. What I fear, both for my science and you know, this is a challenge of theory for young investigators going into this, given the financial environment we're in, this is a really dodgy career. And um, for the science in itself, if we don't continue to explore down these avenues, we stop, we go backwards, we're on our way back to the caves. That's really what I think. And I, to me, this is very important from that point of view as well. So, kind of ranting and soapboxing a bit, but yeah, it, I think it's vital that, that we continue. And, and as I said, the cost, you know, 
people have been doing this. The first human genome cost, what, $5 billion or something like that? And now they're doing a whole human genome for under 1,000. And that's 2006 till now, that's in 10 years. So that's a slight reduction in cost. So to look at the numbers now and, and, and do all your stuff on that, that's absurd. Yeah. Lisa? I'll just have my five cents worth. Um, just from a family's point of view, um, we feel quite privileged that you guys are doing this work at Lincoln. Um, yeah, we are really helpless, and I guess what you guys are giving us is, is real hope. And um, if there's ever anything we can do as families to help, we will. Um, and I think as a um, sort of to show, you know, some external people with no interest in this at all, the faith they have in you, Cure Kids, you're the first organisation that they're going to offer funding to two years in a row. Um, so that's... That's pretty huge, and what you guys are doing are amazing, so thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Mm. Oh, um, there's a thing I forgot. Gerald, Bing, Nadia. EC. Uh, Martin, Katerina. Can you hop down the front here? And you better come along too. Is anyone else I should? Oh, Colin, you better come up, too. <laughs> <laughs> so when we talk about I and us and we, these are who I've been talking about. There's Katerina, who's been with us two years, two and a half, nearly. Um, Nadia, who's the ace in all things she's ever done, um, who's been world famous at Lincoln forever actually <laughs> since about 2001 yeah and has done a lot of this work um, Bing who's been involved with the ATP synthase work Gerald who's been doing the neuroinflammation Martin who's been helping look after the animals and if you want a contraption made to do something or figure out how a clip goes together when it doesn't look at all obvious you talk to Martin it's amazing um, and Colin who really got our sheep flocks organized and um, in decent numbers and stuff at actually Dean and took a real interest in that and I'd like to thank you all. Um, and there's Graham Burrell. <laughs> <laughs> and these are the two surgeons. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, well, thank you all. I mean, I, just, I feel privileged having worked with you all and it doesn't mean I'm gonna die or stop tomorrow. <laughs> Um, when you go outside, as I said through the talk, there's a number of posters. If you find one of these people, they'll explain it to you um, if they interest you. I hope some of them do. Um, thank you. <laughs>